Sean in Texas. His pronouns are he, him. Sean, you are live on the line. What's going on? Uh, not much. Uh, I was just calling in. I, I, I don't. I try to watch this, but I, I, I can't watch. Uh, I can't watch everything at once. So I, I try to just watch it as I can, and I, I usually just get it late. So, but I could call in today. So, awesome. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So I, I heard some healthcare things, but. Uh, I just kind of, I want to know your stances on certain healthcare stuff and for the minors, because I'm not really sure. And I know the host switch every day, so it's kind of, I'm not sure if y'all differ in that, so. Sure. I think we uh, probably all align for the most part. Um, typically, how I frame my position is that I support evidence based guidelines on healthcare for minors with regard to trans healthcare. And as of right now, that seems to be that trans minors should have access to age appropriate uh, guided interventions between that are, you know, coordinated with a team, including their parents and medical professionals. Yeah. Okay. Um, I and, was, and I, I was wondering, go ahead. I was wondering if y'all approve of the surgeries for minors. Um, and I didn't know if it was like y'all approve the top, but not bottom, or bottom. Well, I guess if you approve the bottom, you probably approve the top. So it's it's a little complex. Um, generally speaking, most surgeons won't perform surgery on somebody who's under eighteen. In like the vast majority of cases, that is just the the way it is. I think there are probably, to be like intellectually honest, uh, a number of cases where people might uh, qualify for surgical procedures, usually that's not going to happen before age 16. That is like the absolute lowest. And that sounds pretty reasonable to me. I don't know what the exact science is on age-based gender-affirming surgeries. Um, but uh, usually the surgeries that occur before 18 are like top surgery, like um, uh, like a mastectomy for uh, transmasculine people uh -huh. is not, in, not super uncommon. Um, I think there's a very, very limited number of cases of genital surgery happening on anyone under 18. Um, usually the guidelines are just, there, there are too many hoops to jump through. You know, you need uh, letters from several medical professionals and usually uh, like a number of years uh, on healthcare on like hormone replacement therapy or something before they would consider doing that because hormones do affect, in many cases, people's genitals. And so, you know, they want to make sure that those changes are uh, somewhat stable before you go switching things around. But yeah, I, I think it's nuanced. Generally speaking, most surgeries are going to happen when somebody is over 18. But in the few cases where the doctors and the family have all agreed in this situation, this is the best thing for this person. Um, yeah, I mean, I support physicians doing what physicians do, which is making educated, informed decisions for to better their patient's life. Right. My my contention is I don't think um, I don't think minors have the capacity for long-term thought with regard to surgeries. And I know you said that there is very little or that there's a lot of uh, hoops to go through, but I was really wanting to ask of your opinion if you think minors should have bottom and top surgery. And my kind of disagreement is usually with regards to consent and informed consent and then there's there's issues on that line too so i i so but can, sorry can, can i jump yeah in? yeah yeah. go can ahead jump jump in? In. okay um all right so so thank you sean for for you know i'm going to assume you know that you are coming in from a place of wanting to protect you know young people from making um decisions that are could be detrimental to their health um and i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna take you at that so i take a, i want to take a second back and think about the process that arden was speaking about the fact that these procedures there is approved by every major medical association pediatric association every psychological association pretty much 90 
9% of doctors that associate with all of these associations all agree on this as settled clinical research that has been done. But I will go back to one thing because I know that there's a lot of misinformation and there are things that are said like the Swedish protocol or WPATH standards of care. Those are two different standards of care and a lot of times those things get thrown around a lot. And the Swedish protocol, which is another way that people can actually like say, hey, this is how I'm going to choose my way of doing my standards of care, is a valid way of doing uh, gender affirming care if the patient and the family agrees with doing the Swedish protocol type of way of doing it. And then there is the WPATH way of doing things, which is another standard um, of pra- uh, standard of care that physicians, doctors, surgeons, and all of the community also uses. WPATH, however, is a little bit wider because it has more worldly clinical approach. So it has more cop- cultural competency and, and has the ability of a lot of care standards in the doctor because, as you know, doctor-patient relationships can vary from per- person to person. So what we have to do is be able to use all of that evidence, all of that gathered care, and all of that and, and the parents and the family and everybody who's involved and every patient is different. So for example, if somebody comes out as trans at 14 years old, the chances of them getting top surgery right away is very low compared to somebody who is at seven years old or six years old that has been expressing persistent, insistent, and consistent gender dysphoria that shows that this is not a thing that is going to change. In most pediatric and psychological care settings, a child, a minor, has to go through this care for an entire year before any medical interventions are are taken at all. So a lot of this is like social transition. So, So when you're looking at the surgical intervention, you're looking at like the highest tier of the change that happens in a typical transition of of a human person. So you start at the social, then you go to the hormonal, then you go to the, and then you are going into the surgical. But for most time, a young adult, a young person has to go through all of that before they even reach it. So that's why we don't see bottom surgeries happening at 15 or younger. We're not seeing that happening. We're not seeing uh, top surgeries that are happening at any random clip. But go on. I've spoke a lot. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, My contention is really just the ability to consent. So Um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to interrupt you immediately because... We, we hear this a lot. This is a really common talking point. Can minors consent? Mm-hmm. But the fact is that legally speaking, within this U.S., minors don't consent to medical procedures. And that's why we had talked about right. the parent involvement in the process. Um, right. It's not like the parents right. are just right. arbi- it's not like the parents are just arbitrarily deciding, I want my kid to get top surgery. This is a, a coordinated effort with medical professionals who are determining the best care that I can give your child to give them the best outcomes and quality of life would involve getting this procedure at this age. And again, that's extraordinarily rare, but it's not like there's an issue with minors consenting, because if you're going to bring up the issues of minors consenting, that applies to every surgery that's ever happening to minors. Cancer. Cancer. Yeah, anything like that. And I think it's pretty obvious. I think it's pretty obvious. I I, I think it's... uh, Sean, one second, I'll let you talk. Sean, I'll let you talk just one second. Sean, Sean. Hey, Sean. I'll let you talk just one second. My my point is that if we're going to talk about consent for minors and where that issue is, I think we have to be honest. Because if you have an issue with consent for minors, you have an issue with anyone under 18 getting any surgery at all ever. And I think that's pretty obviously ridiculous, right? So let's let's find an, the actual issue of where consent for surgical things for trans people under 18 is, because it's clearly not the minors part, because you don't object to surgery generally for minors, do you? Right. The issue, I, I was trying to say, the issue isn't about the consent as, as just the consent. The issue is about the lasting effects into adulthood. Um, Okay, Which, so then I, I mean, you must a lot have of people evidence. have the same issue with um, circumcision in the, the male community. Uh, there's a lot of issues with things that are done to children lasting into adulthood, which, uh, you know, a lot of the children come to uh, resent the parents for 
or resent the position. So, Sean, or, or let me, let me, position. can I give you, can I give you, can I give you a real world example? Um, so, so, okay, let's say in your world, um, you have, you know, your way, like nobody below the age of 18 is able to get surgery, but yet you have a trans man, let's use a real world example, a trans man who has been a trans man since they were like 14, 13 years old, but because they weren't allowed okay. to get surgery, they're actually forced to bind right? So they can feel comfortable. Binding is where you take the breast tissue and pr compress it downward, which puts a lot of pressure on your spine and rib cage. So there, there well, are a lot of the bind. No, they are. They, they, they are because it's a, it's a psychological thing, right? Because this is, this is, this is the choice that you're given, right? Correct. There, a lot of these minors are That's given right. the choice. That's do you want surgery or do you want to bind because they're, they're going to bind, right? You're not going to be able to stop them from binding because they have massive gender dysphoria in some cases, right? So they're going to bind just so they can, you know, study in school, so they can concentrate, so they can have a normal childhood that they want. However, in this case, they can't have top surgery to relieve the, that pressure. They have to bind. Mm -hmm. So in cases, they're binding. And what happens is by the time they're 18 there is already evidence that shows that their compression of their rib cage is already happened where it's deformed their rib cage and it also um compresses their spine putting back problems on that individual for the rest of their lives like so we're talking about a 18 year old person that is going to contend with the fact that they were unallowed to get something they knew they needed and now have to suffer back problems for the rest of their lives because somebody else made their decision for them when they knew they were a boy the whole time. That's an actual right. thing that happened. They, but again, this is, this is coming down to the consent area where it's like you can't know for the rest of your life as a teenager. Except you for can Sean. Say that they can, but they can't. That's except how we have except Sean, that. except that we actually have data on regret rates for these procedures, including ones for minors. And the regret rates are extraordinarily low, like lower yeah. than commonplace, like medically necessary procedures. If you showed up to me and right. said, and hey, I, wait, I, Sean, I hold on, Sean, 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 Sean. Listen, I, I'm not Josie, okay? Josie's very patient and very sweet. I'm not Josie. I'm not promising you I'm going to be nice or your friend. Uh, if you showed up here and you me. said, if you showed up here and said, I have a paper and it shows that 70% of kids who get top surgery under 18 end up regretting it, I would say you are right. That is a travesty and we need to put more restrictions and guidelines and guards up to protect those children. That's the opposite of what the data says. Actually, it's not even like that. The opposite would be 30% regretting. The number of people who regret is like under 5%. Uh, so it, it, the, this whole like it's consent plus potentially regretting, except you don't have evidence for either of those things. We've already established that consent is a dishonest and irrelevant point to bring up. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to- a very relevant point because the part of a consent is to be informed. And as a child, Sean, you cannot Sean, be informed. Sean, I'm going to mute you. You got to listen. <laughs> Hold on. We've let already me, established me, that consent yeah. is, sorry, I just have to, we've already okay, established that consent is a dishonest and irrelevant point because you have to throw out oh, all please. surgery for minors if you're going to bring up consent, right? Consent is not the actual issue here. The, uh, the is actual issue you could bring up that I do think is honest is that oh. you fear that they're going to regret. That is an honest concern, but it is baseless is the problem. Sorry, Josie, go yeah. ahead. So I just want to I just want to say what? this, Sean, because like I, I just want to say this really quickly because I, I just want to talk about the argument, right? The argument itself. Because, you know, I understand that you're using this of like, hey, the kids can't consent to larger whatever, and and how's Arden has explained, that's a conversation about the medical community of how we deal with any type of procedure for all for all minors. And two, the second argument you were making, which was um, essentially the um, not consent, but oh, regret, 
right? We also can look at knee surgery regret and everything that Arden said, and we'll see that transgender surgery, you know, related surgeries or, you know, any gender affirming surgeries, those surgeries have lower regret rates. So in, in, in I think where we get frustrated, right, is when you bring up those nuanced conversations about trans health in particular, it becomes very bad faith when you only use those really generalized critiques of the medical system and and then put it only on the trans community, which is very small. I'm trying to start off with a general statement and move forward from there. It's Um, not a generalized critique that there's regret rates in surgery. like is that is that not a generalized critique of surgery surgical care that there is regret in surgical care because those things are very that's a generalized critique no the the oh man the concern is that a lot of trans kids and teenagers especially do not keep being trans in the adult their adulthood yes sean and as i pointed out and as i pointed out sean 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 you got to listen. This is my show. I, I get to butt in, especially when you say untrue things that I, I want to counter. Talk 30 seconds and you get five. I know. Yeah. I, I okay. Just, All right, I'm Sean, saying. you want to be like that? You're going to sit on mute while I talk at you. This is how this works. All right. You, you're saying you have concerns about kids growing up to not being trans. Bring evidence is what I'm telling you. We have evidence that these kids aren't regretting that the majority of kids who are starting on puberty blockers continue with their transition that the majority of these kids do not regret these procedures when they're able to access them despite the many many guidelines i am very open to hearing a conversation about issues within the medical community issues about consent within medical community and how that interfaces with the trans experience but so far you have not brought up anything that is unique to how medical uh, interventions apply to trans youth to to actually uh, pair with your objections. You are saying you have concerns about there being regret rate or people not continuing to be trans, but you don't have any evidence. You just have baseless concerns. If you bring evidence, we'll talk about it. And that will be a legitimate factor that might change policy or change my position. But you haven't brought evidence. You've just brought vague gestures at concerns. If you want to actually bring some evidence and make a case, I'm willing to listen, but I'm not just going to let you ramble on saying untrue things uh, un- unprop- like without me s- stepping in, because that's not how this works. You are off mute if you want to respond. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for unmuting me. Uh, the evidence that we were trying to go through was that uh, the trans rate among teenagers is that a lot of them don't continue into trans no, and adults. No, Sean. Are you looking at the Swedish? Are you looking at that Swedish study? That one that's no, been I mean, corrected? It's a, it's a general population study. Specifics is that a lot okay, of Okay, so let me let me explain it for you because I'm actually a researcher and I'm actually a scientist that actually does research on these populations. So in that particular study, that study talked about gender incongruence where they asked really? the parents and people around them to say, hey, uh-huh. okay, this person played with a doll once. But when you actually look at that same study and you actually look at the people who actually identified as transgender that were diagnosed with gender dysphoria, that number actually sticks to closer to 99%. So in reality, when young people are diagnosed with gender dysphoria and are diagnosed by a medical provider that shows consistent, persistent, and insistent uh, uh, gender dysphoria, then that is when you start even thinking about even social transitioning of a human. So, So in reality, when you're looking at that study, we, you have to think about the fact that we are telling you as trans people, people who live and breathe and work on this stuff, we are trying to be able to say, look, if somebody has gender dysphoria, they should get treatment. That's all we're trying to say. Especially right. when you're and a minor. I, I understand the, the treatment aspect of it. What I, what I don't agree with and what I seem, think seems to be the point of contention is that minors, just in the surgery aspect, I don't think that it's a good idea for them to have surgery. We don't allow them to okay. have cosmetic surgeries of other types generally either. See, uh, now, 
I don't like think it's a good idea to have surgery that, you know, they can come up to be an adult and be like, okay, well, I can't get back my breath. Yes. I okay. Can't, uh, I can't have I, bottom surgery reverse. I am. Stuck yes, with Sean. I'm gonna I'm gonna interject now. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna interject it's now. Sean, I'm gonna interject now because here here is where I feel like the conversation's actually gotten honest. You said you don't feel like all of those things you just said, right? But why should anyone care what you feel when what you feel is in stark contrast to what all the evidence says? as agreed upon by the vast majority of medical organizations within the United States. Why should anyone care what Sean from Texas has to say? I get this idea that you're saying that, like, all the evidence backs me, but I don't see the evidence backing you. Oh, okay. Well, they don't have to. What what, what evidence would convince you otherwise, Sean? What evidence? Wait, what? Sean, listen. Sean? Interrupting people, but I don't... Okay, you're going to cry about muting again? You're back on mute, (laughs) motherfucker. Buckle up. Every major medical organization disagrees with you. We can literally pull up a list right now of every major medical organization whose care you have guaranteed, guarantee my life on it, you have depended on at some point in your life or a loved one has depended on it for a vital life-saving care and you accept their evidence on every other issue. Why not this one? Why do you think what Sean has to say should fucking matter on this issue when you don't care what Sean has to say on every other medical issue these people agree upon. You defer to them on every other medical issue. Why is that, Sean? Are you going to cry about being muted again? Or are you going to actually show up with some fucking evidence to back up your point? You are off mute. Yeah, Ben, you are you keep getting me in the middle of my point. but Okay, uh... no, I don't care. You have I've given you so many opportunities to make your point, And all you do is cry about how you aren't making your point that's not my problem you could show up and say i have evidence x that proves point y and we would accept it because we are skeptics who follow the evidence where it leads but sean you are now gone because you are not welcome to show up and make no effort to demonstrate your claims and then cry about it it's not my problem uh sean is gone (laughs) Oh, and, and my community uh, in uh, the Love Nest, when I when I do ever stream again, um, we call that throwing the spice rack. And you definitely did that. I love that. <laughs> I uh, listen. I it's so frustrating because I genuinely I I've had people show up on this show and in my personal life and in conversations where they brought evidence that made me go, oh shit. I, I need to refine my position and actually like integrate what that is because that actually does affect me and, and how I approach this conversation. You've done that to me a number of times. Your approach is like, oh shit, I maybe shouldn't, shouldn't always throw the spice rack. But my problem is on this show, in, in the conversation, broadly speaking on trans rights, people like Sean are allowed to talk unrestrained often in the public sphere to just go on saying untrue things Uh, oh, well, these kids are going to grow up and regret their surgeries. Sure, an astronomically small amount of them might, but that's not a reason to ban access to healthcare. Uh, It isn't in any other field. And I like that on this one show, if you bring evidence, you're allowed to talk. I'm not going to interrupt you. But if you make baseless claims and refuse to back them up, I'm not going to give you my platform to spew that from. Uh, That's how I feel about it. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's valid because like, you know, it becomes a point, and you could tell, and like, there's a beam of sun going to my face. But um, you know, I when I when I see these conversations and trying to root it back to like the logic, it's like, okay, you're trying to say this logical statement. Let's bring it back to being a generalized critique. You realize how quickly. He ran away from that. He's like, no, I yeah. don't want to make a general critique, a generalized critique on surgical re- regrets. Oh, that's because you're trying to come up with something and shove it in and find a justification for not allowing trans people to have a thing. And yeah. it doesn't work that way. Like you either have to completely throw out the entire medical system and everything that it stands for to try to like regret or try to re- re- restrict the right of people to have access to their bodies it just you don't get to just pick it on your fifis like it just doesn't right. like i'm sorry i don't care yeah. how you feel medical doctors are doctors not people they're doctors for medical science not for their feelings like it's like come on do you imagine if doctors use their feelings on i 
feel like you should probably get this surgery. It's like, yes. really, doctor? It's like, I just have a feeling. It's and just I'm, me. I just feel this is going to be good for you. And I'm comfortable with people having their feel. Just like I'm comfortable with people having feelings about abortion. You're allowed to not like abortion, to disapprove of abortion. I don't have a problem with you having a problem with abortion. What I have a problem with is you trying to, against the evidence, assert that your worldview about abortion should dictate how other people should get to live their lives and access medical care. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, if you don't like trans issues, that's fine. You don't have to like trans issues. You don't have to like trans people. But what you don't get to do is discriminate against us and deny us access to medical care that is evidence-based. Yes. Uh, Hello, I'm Jimmy Snow, executive producer for The Line and avid candy eater. Hey, if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so now on Patreon or as a channel member with tiers specific to supporting specific shows and hosts. And it also supports our ability to expand programming going forward. You could also leave a super thanks down below, get a little special highlighted comment. And I'll tell you what, you could hit like and you could hit subscribe. Now, here are some video suggestions so we can fudge that algorithm. Go with one of ours. Forget everyone else on YouTube. I'm begging.